want to give a shout out to the KC Clay Guild for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. KC Clay Guild has been supporting ceramic artists and providing a space to explore clay in Kansas City, Missouri since 1988. The Guild is now accepting applications for their Artist in Residence program until April the 15th. This program is open to anyone who is looking to jumpstart their ceramic career. The Guild has been upgrading their already well-equipped studio and will be adding a new Blau gas kiln in December of this year. Benefits include a private studio space, free firing, opportunities to teach, and an annual stipend. To find out more or to apply today, visit kcclayguild.org slash air. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 368 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Paul Greenhalsh. He's currently the executive director of the Sainsbury Center, which is a gallery and think tank that is connected to the University of East Anglia, where he is also a professor of art history and museum strategy. He's on the show talking about his new text, Ceramic Art and Civilization, We also spend a good bit of time talking about museum management and his time spent as the head of research at the V&A in London. To find out more about Paul, you can check him out on his website. That's paulgreenhalsh.net. You can also find him on Instagram at paul underscore greenhalsh underscore 1893. Before we get to that interview, I wanted to plug the Tales from the Vault podcast feed. This is exclusively for Patreon subscribers and features remastered ad-free versions of episodes that are no longer available on major podcast servers. The whole first season has been remastered and is available now. To have access to that, you can go to patreon.com slash redclayrambler where you can sign up to make an ongoing monthly donation. If you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can do that by visiting the website at talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. To start, I wanted to talk about the concept of the book, though. You had written in, in one of the early chapters that in ceramics, we don't have a tie that, that binds the, the greater historical narrative together. I think you described it as we almost have, it's like a necklace with a lot of shiny beads, but there's no actual line that they're put on to hold them around our necks. So can you talk about the concept for the book, wanting to write a larger history about the big picture? I think that the idea of this book really came from the idea of uh, teaching students doing ceramics programs and teaching ceramic over a long period of time and realizing that uh, there is a bigger story to this art, which probably hasn't really been told that clearly. And if we look at the other major arts like painting and architecture and areas of sculpture, there is a grand story which historians have articulated that kind of joins it all together, joins together the great periods and shows what the language of that art is. And in many ways, it occurred to me that uh, ceramic had a history which is uh, a bag of beads, many lovely individual things, but the bigger thread was hard to find, like what does connect the ancient Greeks to the medieval, to the Renaissance, what ties all those wonderful potters in America now 
what ties them back to their own heritage and shows where it came from. Because of all of the arts, you know, arguably ceramic is the most ancient in the sense that uh, we have lots of it left. It doesn't deteriorate. And so uh, we have that sense of uh, history hanging over. When someone sits down to make a pot, uh, the oldest shards we now have are about 30,000 BC. So you're taking part in a big history uh, as you sit down in New Jersey or California to make a pot. You're taking part in something very grand and very uh, fundamental to being a human being uh, because pots are how we stored food. They're how we buried our dead, how we did rituals. If you think of tiles and roof tiles, it's how we sheltered. And so it's a fundamental art to do with quality of life. And yet um, it needs joining up. And I, the other thing which occurred to me is that we had wonderful things written by archeologists and by classicists and by 19th century historians and by contemporary writers. But it seemed to me in some senses that they hadn't been communicating with each other necessarily. So I set about trying to pull all this together to tell a grand story. And uh, in some ways, I wish I didn't, <laughs> because it's been a life shortening exercise. Uh, but I spent a lot of time talking to students as I taught in colleges in America and in Europe, asking them how they saw it. And so in some ways, I hope that the story has a feel of people who have engaged and who uh, enjoy uh, what ceramic is. I think also in the States, we have that program, which I think began in the UK, the Antiques Roadshow. And uh, everyone is obsessed with it uh, <laughs> in the sense of what they really want to know is how much money is this thing worth? And uh, in Britain, they're far too polite to ask that. But in America, they always put they always put the amount at the bottom and it kind of goes ka <laughs> because Americans are honest. <laughs> and... Uh, but nevertheless, if you look at any one antiques uh, roadshow program, about half of it will be pots. And what's all often interesting is that it will be ordinary everyday people who got those pots that suddenly have become uh, rare and valuable. So uh, in, a, in a sense, it's a ubiquitous art. It's an art that's everywhere. Uh, the most which has so far been paid for a pot, a gorgeous uh, ancient Chinese pot, someone paid... Uh, I think it was 53 million pounds about three years ago. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, that's a lot of money to pay for a pot. But we know that pound stores and dollar stores are full of it. So for me, that makes it kind of magical. Uh, the fact that I'm uh, sipping tea from a pot as we speak. So uh, I set about trying to write a different kind of history which isn't just about uh, great artists. And, uh, you know, it's not a story in the same sense as how you would talk about Rembrandt or Van Gogh, as wonderful as those people are. It's somewhat different. Um, there are some potters who are a bit like Rembrandt or Van Gogh, but they tend to be in groups. They tend to, it tends to be a team activity. It tends to be very close to ordinary street life. Uh, there's been a huge tendency for potters over the centuries to illustrate their pots, to put slogans on their pots. Uh, your favorite football team, your favorite pop star, your favorite political party, often very rude things, you know, compliments to people like Donald Trump uh, <laughs> and so on and so on. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a medium which has been on the street and among us and occasionally rises to the very highest level. Uh, I think some of the pictures in the book are, for me, the greatest works of art, amongst the very greatest. And other things are not. They're things which we hold in great affection. And uh, from that perspective, uh, it's a fascinating history. So I was hoping to try and convey that. Perhaps um, talk about art in a different way. Talk about art in a way that is to do with civilization. Uh, and to ponder on what uh, a civilized life should be for all of us. Uh, it is the case that the great historian Kenneth Clark 
wrote a book and did a TV series called Civilization decades ago. And it, that was really about the greatest works of art. It was really Michelangelo to Picasso in a way, which is, I think, completely legitimate. But I've been thinking, what is a civilized life? You know, how, what would we say in uh, 2021 as we sit here locked down with COVID, uh, as we have world crises, as we have as many wars as we ever did, uh, as we have the technologies that can make everyone's life more pleasant, but we've not done that. Uh, we have better killing technologies than ever before in history. So uh, I wanted to think about, you know, what contribution could art be in the widest sense to changing things for the better, rather than being the icing on the cake? Uh, how does art become the cake in that sense? And in order to do that, one of my own favorite thinkers is uh, the French thinker Pierre Bourdieu, who uh, at the start of his wonderful book, Distinction, said, I'm going to try and describe culture uh, in the same way that we would talk about the culture of food or the culture of a good meal, not simply culture as a high thing trapped in museums, uh, but culture as something which is there with us all, our clothes, our houses, where we are. And of course, we would all, I think most of us would say that would be a good idea. Uh, so going forward in a world where we're going to be facing mass unemployment, where our high streets are disappearing, uh, where we appear now to have developed super clever global viruses that threaten all of us. The terrible tragedy uh, from, my uh, from my point of view, uh, one loves to travel. And I, I often think that the more that people travel and meet other people, the more that we'll stop having wars, if you get my meaning, the more we'll understand each other. But sadly, we're, we, we might be going into a world where we can't travel as we did because of... So I think time has come for us all to sit back and think about uh, what a quality life is. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's an aim of the book. And uh, I describe ceramic as a domestic art in the sense that clearly the museums are full of it and you have masterpieces. It doesn't just mean it's in the kitchen, but the aim of ceramic was always from earliest times about quality of life, interestingly, uh, about what it was like uh, to live in, uh, you know, tiles, figurines, small figures, they're to do with domestic size sculpture. And uh, it's about art in the home. Uh, ceramic is cheap. You know, it's basically mud, you know, and I do say at one point in the book, it's very interesting that when invading armies in the past invaded a country, they would often take the potters themselves with them and get them to make pots in their own country. The Japanese did that. The ancient Romans did that. British, very good at that. The British, very good at sealing people's stuff. But they would often take the actual potters. Uh, in other words, the material, you never got a situation where they took the goldsmiths and left all the gold behind. You know, they didn't do that. Uh, they took the gold. And uh, so it's very interesting, is it, that ceramic is to do with skill. It's to do with taking something worth nothing and making it worth something. So uh, one started to think about quality of life in that wider way of, uh, I don't know, I'm sure it's the case in the States that everybody over here is making their own bread now. You know, everybody's <laughs> dug a pond in the garden. Everybody's started to try and do woodwork and try. And, there's been a surge of amateur ceramic, that is people getting involved because we're all trapped in our houses and we can't travel like we did. And uh, I think we all like it. We like it. And maybe that will lead to a point where we move towards a three-day week in employment and whereby we start to think about quality of life on the street and at home. So, sorry, I'm going on. But I think that um, what I was trying to convey was that maybe there's a different way of thinking about art more fundamentally. 
uh, and how at one level we can all engage and in skill, we can all engage in uh, quality of life. And maybe uh, one of the aspects of ceramic, which is so interesting is how profoundly international it was very early on. It was an international industry uh, uh, well before the birth of Christ, thousands of years before the birth of Christ. Uh, the ancient Roman ceramic industry was like Ikea. It, um, you could buy standardized pots, which if you, you could buy pots made in different countries and they would stack. Uh, there was a huge market. Quality of life for people, you know, went up with this interesting international trade. Uh, and so one got a sense of uh, thinking back uh, to how ceramic has been in history and the good it's done and how we might uh, think again about culture more generally. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, and one of the frameworks you used is to lay out four transformers that shifted both cultures around them ceramically, but also shifted larger cultures. So there was classicism, uh, China, uh, the Islamic world, and the modern era. So can you talk about picking those four? Like what makes those four time periods so influential to the rest of the global ceramic culture? Mm, sorry, you have, uh, you've actually read it. It's very impressive. <laughs> uh, I would say that when I, I look, try to look at the whole two and a half, last two and a half thousand years from above to look down on it, it did occur to me that there'd been these kind of almost tsunami uh, uh, moments where the world changed in ceramic and that it transmitted around the world surprisingly quickly and that and there were a small number of these uh, transformations that changed the ceramic world pretty much globally and that you can still see the evidence uh, in now in contemporary those those things have hung around there's no doubt that the first one was the classical world uh, effectively the Greeks and the Romans this is for the western tradition whereby they developed a way of making ceramic uh, they developed a way of consuming ceramic. They developed a way whereby a wide number of people had high quality vessels to eat and drink from. They developed ceramic which had interesting messages on, uh, illustrated uh, pop star, if, if the equivalent of pop stars and sporting heroes started appearing. So uh, that moment changed and uh, the classical trade carried those ideas all over uh, what is now Europe and right through the Middle East, North Africa, and right through uh, to the borders of China virtually. Uh, the second major wave that changed everything, I think, most dramatically were, were the Islamic nations and the rise of Islam in the seventh century and then the incredible speed with which the Islamic peoples, uh, driven by the uh, Arabs, first of all, conquered an enormous chunk of the world. And they brought a very particular idea of um, sophisticated civilization. And one of the things they brought was a whole raft of new approaches to ceramic, to ceramic pattern, to ceramic glaze work. And there is absolutely no doubt that without them, there would not have been a Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance in Italy and Spain owes everything to what they learned from the Islamic potters. And, uh, and again, that, that shift uh, of thinking about ceramic, you can still see it. It's still in evidence around and uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, there are records from Queen Elizabeth in England, her court of them talking, and they were desperate to get Islamic ceramics uh, from Africa into England in the 15th, 16th century. It's incredibly interesting. Anyway, that to one side. The third major wave was China. And we would maybe say that China is the most sophisticated ceramic culture, full stop. And uh, they were doing more with ceramic and their ceramic technology was absolutely in front of everyone. And in effect, they flattened the world. Once, once that stuff started arriving in quantities, it came to dominate the world. Uh, they invented porcelain, which is a very particular fine 
durable, very beautiful form of ceramic. And they developed that by about 900 AD. It was 1708, uh, 800 years later, before the Europeans worked out how to do it. So through that entire period, we were, being, we were paying top dollar for Chinese ceramics because the Chinese were the only ones who could do it. And uh, again, it transformed everything. And of course, I, I'm sure it's the case in America, but everybody, you know, most people's mothers have a little cabinet where they keep their favorite bits of ceramic. And I put in the book that my mother loved those bits of ceramic more than she loved us. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you, you know, but uh, they call it China, my best China. And you tend to forget it's a country. It's um, quality ceramic became so associated with the Chinese that we just call it China in this country. And I know it's a habit also in the States, my very best China. So those three strands transformed. And then the modern period, and that's really where America comes to play. Uh, I would say Britain and America dominated uh, uh, the last two or 300 years in terms of uh, developing a new vision of ceramic, uh, not just wonderful new technology, but also the idea of the ceramic artist, of the individual who would set up and make ceramic as works of art is powerfully an American story, uh, I would say. Develops in France and in the UK, and then taken to a great, great height. And uh, one of the great golden moments, I think, in the history of ceramic is the West Coast, uh, West Coast American ceramic. There's great ceramic all over America, but it reached a tremendous peak there. And uh, so these four transformatory moments give us what ceramic is today, I, I argue comes in waves. So it's it's not really an even history. It's a history in which there's dramatic change. And then everyone gets that and then they move on and then there's another one and, and so forth. Yeah. One of the things I like about the book is that when you talk about these large, you describe them as a tsunami, you know, that they're these aesthetic and cultural influences are so powerful that they push through in other ways that that things like even war don't do. So for instance, I, w I wanted to talk about um, the Islamic influence in Spain um, and specifically in, in Menenses. Is that how you say the, the, the town? It's outside of Valencia. How do you say that yeah, town? Manis. Manis. Yeah. Manis. Okay. So that's an example of uh, a huge, it was an Islamic territory. It was uh, a, a aesthetic powerhouse. Like those, those lusterware pots are just like mind bending. But it was a real blending of Islamic sense of pattern and at times a uh, European sense of Christianity. But what's fascinating is the pots blended in ways that the people didn't successfully blend. So there were wars to push uh, Islam out, but it didn't push the aesthetic out. The aesthetic outlasted even the political structures. So can you talk about a, pl a place like that? Like how, how does that talk about a grander history of blending culturally? I think it is an incredibly interesting observation that quite often major armies take over a place and control it for centuries. And then when they're gone, they're just gone. But frequently, if they bring cultural interests with them, that remains and it remains uh, can remain a huge benefit. And so it was in 711 that uh, the Islamic nations invaded Europe proper. They landed in Gibraltar and then they took Spain and they flattened Spain very quickly uh, and moved over the Pyrenees into France. There was a, a small skirmish battle there where they were held up. But really, uh, the Europeans were incredibly lucky in the sense that had the Islamic, the various Islamic nations wished to carry on, I think there's little doubt they would have swept right through the whole of Europe at that stage. But they didn't. They kind of stopped at the Pyrenees and they controlled Spain for five centuries. And what is interesting is that we might argue that in terms of religion and politics, it never completely settled, even though in some ways it was a new golden age for Spain. The Islamic nations were so much more sophisticated and complex. Uh, but the ceramic culture was fantastically interesting because it's as though the potters carried on using some of the medieval ideas that were there really quite crude. European ceramic was in quite a poor condition. 
uh, and they added the mad majestic pattern making and technology that um, that various Islamic nations, especially the Arab nations, had developed. And it developed a kind of ceramic we call hispano moresque It was especially strong in Valencia, in an area called Maniz. And there are marvelous collections actually uh, in the New York region. Uh, the Hispanic Society of America has a collection of pots there that were made uh, in 13th, 14th, 15th centuries in Spain, which are some of the greatest masterpieces of anything on the West Coast. And they're all there in that wonderful museum, very close to New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a blend of Islamic ideas and, and medieval European ideas, and it, 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 it works. It's very beautiful. It is fascinating that perhaps that blend didn't work in other ways. Uh, Eventually, then, uh, the Christian powers pushed Islam out of Spain. And as we know, uh, a number of the great Spanish cities still have architectural masterpieces uh, uh, from the Islamic age. Uh, but one thing which is very powerful and stayed in Spain was the ceramic technology. Uh, Islam brought uh, what is known as tin glaze. Tin glaze is a way of making a beautiful white glaze that you can put patterns on and luster glaze, where you can make the ceramic look uh, shine like metal. That's pure Islam. And that became the Spanish thing. The Spanish then taught the Italians how to make it, and it became the basis of the Italian Renaissance in ceramic. The Italians then transmitted it to the north of Europe. Uh, the British, probably the very last to get it, to be honest, very slow on the uptake, the British. <laughs> uh, but it came to dominate the whole of Europe. So effectively, uh, Islam transformed the whole of European ceramic uh, with their example. And it remained that way for centuries and centuries after that, uh, long after uh, the Islamic powers had pulled out of uh, uh, from the European peninsula. So very interesting. As someone who went to school for ceramics, I was educated about the aesthetic influence of China through the Middle East into Europe. Like we know a lot about that. Why is there not as much known about the south to north transmission, like, say, su through South America into North America or through Southern Africa into Northern Africa? Like, why do you think that geology or sorry, geography became culturally so interesting to Europeans and then to Americans? What I think is interesting about cultural interest, uh, uh, cu cultural influence generally, but it comes through powerfully in ceramic, is exactly as you suggest. There's a geography to it, uh, a geography of power. And uh, the grand empires and the most powerful nations tend to transmit their ideas uh, in, a, in a more readily and direct way than others. Uh, other cultures do seep in, but it takes it takes a lot longer, I would say. So, for example, the influence of um, uh, Southern Africa and Middle and Southern Africa clearly became very powerful on later 19th and 20th century ceramic generally. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a slow picking up. Whereas Islam, because uh, the, the, the move of Islam from the east to the west was so powerful and all dominating that they brought their technologies. Those were absorbed very quickly. So it is fascinating. America is interesting because um, we would say, when we really think about it and look at the last 2000 years, the growth of America was surprisingly parallel to the growth of Britain. That is to say, Britain, there is no such thing as a pure British anything. It was successive waves of migrants uh, before the Romans, people forget the Celts are not originally from Britain. They're an Indo-Eurasian race of peoples. They were displaced by the Romans. The Romans got displaced by the Angles and Saxons, the Picts, the Scots. Scots not original, of course, to Scotland. They began, uh, they swept around and came via Ireland. So success, and then the Normans, and again and again, then the Scandinavians and the Vikings, all of them completely different cultures with different languages. And all of that got added to the pie, which then finally stabilized. Uh, if you think about it, uh, none of us will be in any doubt about 
American culture now. And there's an American way of telling a joke. There's American food. There's American art, American cars. If you, it's very interesting. Quite hard to put your finger on it always, but you can always tell. Fascinatingly, of course, uh, American culture, you, you know, there were the uh, native American peoples, and that's a, that's a different and tragic story. But when we think of the migrant populations, it was a blending of dozens of different people that arrived at this kind of powerful common culture. It's fascinating, I think. And uh, ceramic is rather like that. It's a hybrid. It's dirt cheap. It's, well, it's literally dirt. And uh, so it's really reliant on skill of the uh, community and the artists who make it. Unlike gold, I mean, gold, a big lump of gold can be as ugly as you like. Uh, people still love it. <laughs> and so this challenge of making clay into something, it, it picks up and mimics and steals from all over the place. So, uh, and then finally it becomes itself. You know, there is a thing called American ceramic. You can always tell. Uh, you can always feel it. Uh, the magnificence of Chinese and Japanese and perhaps Korean ceramic. Korean ceramic, perhaps uh, the greatest of all. Uh, but uh, as with the Koreans, uh, quite shy and unassuming. Uh, all these cultures developed a vision of ceramic that then got blended uh, when they were carried around the world. Uh, it's fascinating. In that sense, ceramic is kind of like people. Every American has a little bit of about a hundred other cultures in them, uh, probably literally via their DNA, uh, uh, but but in their cultural outlook, in the way they speak, and the way they are, and that attitude. Every American has that, uh, and I would say of all the arts, ceramic reflects that more than anything. There's a little bit of all. You know, the big four waves I suggested, uh, you can spot them all, sometimes in a single pot, uh, but dozens of other lesser, more local influences as well uh, arriving, I think is uh, what makes it so magical. And then you've got a subtle difference between East and West Coast and so forth, you know. Well, I wanted to expand out from um, the framework of the book itself and talk more about how we as humans store our history. So you, you've worked in museums a lot. You've worked in institutes of higher education. You know, you worked at the VNA for a long time. And, and before we get into a deeper question, can you just talk about what your job at the VNA was? Yeah, I worked at the VNA altogether for about a dozen years. And uh, by the way, that counts as like nothing. You know, that means you've only <laughs> just started for the, the I had a wonderful colleague just retired after 48 years and he thought he wasn't the longest serving, you know, <laughs> so extraordinary place. And uh, I started as a teacher. In fact, the VNA started to teach programs with the Royal College of Art and other art schools. And they took me in to do that. Then I became deputy keeper of ceramics and glass. Uh, then I took a few years uh, out teaching again. And then my final job for the longest time, uh, I was head of research at the v &A. So I had a, a brief to look at all of the collections. And we had teams of people who did uh, uh, tried to pioneer new new forms of research and new approaches to the collections. Yeah. So museum Twitter, which is like the, the folks that have that are on Twitter that are museum professionals has been a, f a flame yes uh, recently because the VNA is changing their structure you know they're they're moving away from having individual say wood and metal and ceramics into an approach of showing or this is what they're going to do in the next year change it to where they're going to show these objects in a timeline so as someone who has worked in museums can you talk about how museums can successfully teach us, the public, about these objects or about the history of the people that made the objects through either a compartmentalized approach, which is what the VNA is, was founded on, versus what's going to be this new approach of a historical timeline or this progression of one culture to the next? Uh, what I would say is that the the issue uh, the VNA has as an encyclopedic museum 
is exactly the same issue that the Met has in New York and many other of the grand big museums, whereby you have big collections of specific materials and you need expertise on those in order to know what they are to start with um, uh, and to be able to, with confidence, uh, identify and attribute so that that's known. But at the same time, all materials uh, change uh, from period to period uh, and, and all the different grand disciplines relate to one another. So, uh, for example, in my book, one, one of the most interesting things about ceramic is uh, it's the magpie of, uh, of world art in the sense that it steals from everybody and then makes something different. So famously, ceramic st stole from metalwork because they knew they could undercut them for price. So somebody makes a lovely silver cup, you make a lovely ceramic cup and you can charge half the price and there you are. So uh, all of the arts feed off each other. So the problem for a curator in a, in a multidiscipline museum is, is to do both things at once, I would say, to have knowledge of the specific materials and to have uh, knowledge of period so that you can explain so uh, there are reasons why an Art Deco cup looks different from an ancient Greek cup. And the differences are bound up in their society, uh, which is different from their society. Uh, and so the museum has to have, I would say, multiple approaches to make, uh, to make real sense. And uh, the v &A was founded on grand uh, materials-based departments ceramics, glass, metal, woodwork, and so on. And that's very, very good for acquiring and knowing and attributing and knowing what you've got. But we would say in the last 50 or so years, increasingly the public wants to know, wants to understand how these things fit into the world, uh, what they're about, how they work. And so increasingly, uh, and the v is not the only one, most museums also have period-based approaches. So I would say that whilst this is a restructuring of the teams at the v &A, uh, clearly the colleagues who work there are essentially the same uh, group of people. There will be new people added, of course, there always are. Uh, and so uh, the emphasis now will be on period, but clearly they will also have an interest in the individual materials as well. So uh, it's a wonderful intellectual debate and everyone's getting excited about it, but my, my perception is uh, it, it will continue. Uh, I would say I'm probably a reasonably typical product of that kind of place because I'm really a historian of, say, later 19th and 20th century, uh, 1880 to 1940. Much of my work has been in that period, which I, I think is a golden age in all of the arts. Uh, the early modern period is just incredible. Uh, and I've written a lot about that, but I've always loved ceramic. So I decided to step out and to take some time to write this, this book, which I felt there was a need for. Uh, they're different modes of history, I would say, but uh, both very important. And uh, uh, so that's really what's going on there, I would say. Uh, and we shouldn't, uh, you know, we can't make light of the fact that um, uh, uh, what COVID has done to our museums internationally is, is desperate. And I'm sure the colleagues are also now sitting back thinking, what's the best way we can keep the door open? Uh, what's the best way we can carry on studying this material? And, and clearly that will be an element in it as well. And uh, uh, we're all of us desperate to get our doors open again, because for many of us, it's how we make our income. And, and clearly, for me, uh, an object does not exist until someone's looking at it. You know, why, why would you want a building full of stuff if the door's closed? Uh, it might as well not be there. Uh, so the museum colleagues have to protect and conserve and look after these things for us. Uh, but at the same time, until people are enjoying them, uh, they have no meaning. And so uh, we're in these very sad times. And obviously our colleges and universities have a similar kind of problem, uh, you know, until the students are back there, 
the the thing loses its meaning. So strangest times for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the thing I liked about people being angry at each other on Twitter about a museum changing its structure is that they care. And that is a little bit of a miracle. <laughs> so I, I think that there there's something to be said for a museum protecting itself financially, because I think some of this change is that they said they had 20%. This was in 2020. They had 20% of the visitors that they had the year before, which how can a museum run on 20% visitorship? I mean, there's so much money that's coming in from the outside guest. And also, the you know, the British state doesn't want to or can't or I don't want to say doesn't want to, but, you know, state funding changes when tourist uh, taxes go away. And that's just the reality of what we're in. Um it's every museum system is funded slightly differently. Uh, America is interesting is that it seems to me it has multiple ways of funding. I mean, the, the grand museums in DC are state funded, but many of the individual states give to their museums and many individual cities. Uh, America is wonderful because of its philanthropy. Many, you know, much of America's wealth puts back in to the museum system. And that's truly wonderful. In the UK, uh, it's now at this stage, I would say, a mixed economy. Uh, the government gives a certain amount. Uh, throughout the country, quite often the individual cities, city councils give a certain amount. But increasingly, you have to raise your own money. And you do it with your shop, your restaurant, and you do it with wonderful people who become attached to you and, and support you and give you funding. And you add all these pieces together and uh, aim to keep the door open. Um, likewise, uh, quite a lot of the system in the UK and the, the museum uh, I'm executive director of, the Sainsbury Centre, the permanent collections are free. So you can see that uh, without paying anything. But when we do uh, a major temporary exhibition, we charge for that. And that, that tends to be the system uh, the British nationals use, that you see the permanent collection for nothing, so everyone can go to the museum. Uh, and they then uh, we charge for the special show. And the reason for that is that if we didn't, we couldn't do it. You know, it's uh, I'd love to give everything away for free in life, but we all know you cannot really do that uh, always. So that's the system we're using. So we're uh, at the Sainsbury Centre, enormously dependent on visitors. Uh, buying a ticket for the special show, drinking a cup of tea, obviously, UK, always tea, sometimes <laughs> coffee, uh, <coughs> and to buy something in the shop. Uh, I think it's up to about, uh, around about 25% of our income is earned that way now, uh, perhaps a little more, and that will continue to go up. So uh, all of us are dependent on getting open again and getting moving again uh, through COVID. Uh, there will be casualties in America and in Europe. There are bound to be uh, museums that don't survive this moment. And that's, um, that's sad for all of us. Uh, and I agree with you. I kind of enjoy it when there's huge debate and big fights around a museum because you know that they, you know, you know that they love you. They want you to be there. And that it's like having someone in your family that you're fed up with. Um, uh, it's because you love them. And um, uh, it's wonderful that people care so much about the museums. I might add, I noticed that the debates, uh, a lot of the Twitter is from America, uh, uh, which is fascinating. And likewise, you know, the greatest museums in America, uh, one loves those places. Uh, many of the pots in my book are from the great American collections and uh, wonderful things. Can you talk about being a professional who has a, either a museum career or um, you've been the head of, of, a, of a university? You know, there you almost have two parallel tracks going at all times, it seems. There's your research and your writing, and then there's your museum directing or gallery directing or school directing. H how do you actually manage this? Like, when do you sleep? Because <laughs> you, you have a consistent writing practice through running major, major institutions. It's very kind of you to say. I would say that uh, in my own career, I it dawned on me early on that for me, 
um, the physical presence of, uh, of the art itself was incredibly important to me. So I've quite rarely worked as an art historian in a, in a university department where there is no collection. Uh, or alternatively, I've chosen to work with practitioners and um, uh, to be amongst ceramic uh, people. I obviously love the history of painting as well. So I've either opted to work in art schools uh, or in museums, I, either where it's being made and the artists are or where the, where the finished works of art are. I've, I've always opted to do that. And then over the years, you know, uh, increasingly one got to a point where you were running places sometimes. And um, what I tried to do was always to keep a thread of my own work going, because in my case, it occurred to me that um, that if you were trying to practice yourself, you were trying to write, you were trying to think about things, it could only help how you manage the place. Uh, that you, uh, in order to, the only way you can really run a place, in my view, is that if you empathize and have empathy for the things that you're running and that you stay close to them. If you're going to run an art school, you've got to have a sense of what it is to be an art student, especially uh, at this point in time. It's a very brave thing to study uh, the arts at this point in time because you've got no guarantee uh, of life ahead. Uh, you never did have a guarantee, but it's harder still. So for me, it was always very, very important to stay close. And how I did that was uh, continuing to write. So for many years, in fact, uh, I was really writing essays rather than whole books and or editing uh, just to keep my thing alive. But it's really a case of evenings and weekends and uh, scribbling things in the pub uh, and then uh, and then slowly working something up. Uh, I'm at a point now where I will shortly step back completely uh, uh, from that side and uh, uh, become pretty much a full-time writer and perhaps curate a few things. So uh, this book uh, marks that point where I think I want to, I want to, there are three or four more books I would like to write uh, uh, with a bit of luck if I get the time to do it. And um, uh, I've decided to focus in those areas. So I will still be doing some curating and some uh, consulting. And uh, I always enjoy teaching, especially uh, practitioners. Uh, it's a great joy. Uh, I always thought that I learned more by uh, teaching students and feeding off their energy. And, uh, and often they have incredibly unusual points of view that never occurred to you. Uh, so you learn when you teach, I think. And uh, so I will do some of that and then hopefully focus more or less on, on writing. But I do believe that even the person in charge, uh, it's a good idea if it's, if it's possible. It's not always possible, if you can, to make some time uh, to engage yourself in practice. It's not always possible. But if you do that, you go, it's... Um, it's a humbling process. You're teaching art students, good idea to sit at home sometimes and draw, remind yourself how impossibly hard it is. Uh, you don't need to show anyone, it's just good to remind yourself how difficult it is. And stringing together sentences is very hard. You know, it's tricky, very good, very humbling to do that. Uh, so that that's really uh, been uh, my view of uh, my view of uh, professional life. When I first opened the book, I was surprised at how the writing style is at, at one point dense and at another point very accessible. And some of that has to do with the structure. So each chapter you've broken up into small chunks. So for a student that's, you know, a complete beginner to ceramics, they might not read it, you know, start to finish they might like for me i instantly opened the book and went right to the transformers section because that was the section that i could grasp the fastest <laughs> so when you talk about writing a book about a huge topic you know about ceramics uh, as a civilization civilization builder that is a two hundred and twenty thousand word book like this thing is a is a work it is a major major piece of writing how did you organize it within your own mind as a writer to present it in a way that people could follow that thread that you're pitching in the book? 
I think that uh, when I decided it'd be a good idea to write this book, by the way, a thousand times after that, I thought it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> um, I, I uh, thought that it would go from the ancient Greek industry because that's a moment when things start to shape up, when you can start to talk about Europe a little bit. So I started there and I thought it has to be very heavily also at the end about living potters, contemporary, you know, how they do it now. So once you've decided that, you then uh, look at the chronological periods, look at, but I realized quite early on that I had to say something at the start of the book about what this thing is, because there's no agreement about what this thing is. Like if you work with figures, with ceramic figures, suddenly you're a sculptor, you're not a uh, but we all know that that technology is allied very closely to uh, potting and vessels. Uh, the history of tile is totally bound up with the history of pots. And so I felt that I had to um, work out uh, uh, an initial chapter where I said what I thought this was and what the big issues were, like the fact that there had been these major transforming moments, for example, uh, like there's a very interesting issue on gender. Uh, there's an issue of uh, national and international and so on and so on. The material itself, uh, how we describe it. It's interesting that the Chinese describe it very differently from how we do in, in the Western tradition and so on and so on. So I felt I had to deal with that. And um, I, I w kept going back to the first chapter and changing it and adjusting it and adding things to it uh, whilst plodding, whilst moving through uh, the historic periods. And uh, I would give myself uh, some months to try and write a chapter. So I would send some months completely absorbed in Hispano Moresque or in uh, uh, Bernard Palisi or whatever, or California, I would just bury myself in that for a while and then come out and have a look how it fitted. But I've never really written anything like that before uh, uh, where this giant period had to all join up. And uh, so it, well, it was a peculiar way. And uh, I guess the last chapter to be finished was the first chapter, uh, which was introducing the rest. Uh, I realized that the rest had to kind of be done before I could introduce it. So it was uh, a complicated beast, that's for sure. And I also, at times, I thought I could write quite lightly to describe things, but at, at other times there was quite a complex theoretical or technological thing that there's no point trying to lighten it. You just have to get it down as clearly as you could and hope that people could follow it, you know? Well, I wanted to wrap up the interview reading some of your words back to you, which I know, <laughs> I know as a writer, this can be a scary moment. <laughs> but you, you wrote this quote in uh, actually the postscript where you're comparing California and Attica. And you had said this about skill, it's no coincidence that the most common surnames we have are trades, Smith, Taylor, Turner, and of course, Potter. For more than religion or war or academic treatises, skill shapes civilization, but it hasn't shaped the written history of art. So I wanted to kind of come full circle and come back to skill. Why, why you think skill is a shaper of civilization and why is that important to us? Like as I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a active ceramic potter. Like, why is that reverence for skill something that needs to be incorporated into art history? I didn't realize that, by the way. I'd love to see your work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, I'll show you. Tell me some things. I would love to see that. Yeah, it would be great. Um, uh, my next book is about skill, and uh, I've decided it's going to be quite an aggressive treatise, quite short because I believe that the role and function of skill has been underplayed and dismissed, especially within areas of culture. It's almost as though we're ashamed of it, that it's, uh, uh, that it's a thing that it's redundant. It's a thing we've moved through. Uh, but I would say that if you think about every human being, nearly all of us have something 
in our lives that we try to be good at, uh, that we identify ourselves with, uh, and that give us personal identity. I would say that the exercising of skill, uh, we all engage with it. Uh, lots of us play football on Sundays very badly. We play darts. We collect things. We, you know, it's not just making and physical processing. It's we all of us identify ourselves through what we do. And I think it's very dangerous to underplay that. And I think what is very, very important is that we encourage, uh, as it were, uh, an elite also. That is, I think we all benefit from the fact that Exekias in ancient Greece and uh, Bernard Palisi and Peter Volkos and Bernard Leach, we all of us benefit that these people gave their lives and produced exemplary examples for us. And the rest of us have been, the rest of us can engage, for example. So I think that the social role of skill, how we give ourselves personal satisfaction and how we group as communities. It is interesting that all our surnames, a huge bulk of them relate back. It shows how communal skill is and how we respect it. And I think for self-respect and for giving shape to life, we're now moving forward into an age where genuinely, finally, uh, IT, which I think is wonderful, where technology is really replacing a whole range of daily tasks. Uh, with any luck, we won't need bankers anymore. Um, we'll all enjoy that. But uh, the way that we do so many things in life uh, is being taken over. And I would argue that gives us all time uh, to do something skillfully. Uh, we all tend to prefer handmade food. We all like the idea of, of, of good quality food. We all like the idea of good clothes and uh, so the reality is that right across the piece, we could be taking more time to engage in the quality of life. You know, why are we making crappy buildings that have to be demolished 30 years later? You know, you know, the cathedral in the middle of this little city has been was started in 980. <laughs> it's been there 900 years. It still looks pretty good. Uh, the entire town has been demolished 100 times over around it in over the last 200 years. So why don't we build things properly? Why don't we make our cities properly? Why don't we engage? Why don't we all uh, have fewer things which are well made? Now, these are philosophical debates which have been had for the last 100 years, but I think they're more important now than ever because we're also destroying the planet with cheap throwaway rubbish. And the one good thing about ceramic is that yeah, there are mountains of broken pots all over the world, but they don't hurt anybody. And, uh, you know, replacing ceramic, uh, replacing plastic with ceramic again is not a bad idea, for example. So uh, I would say that thinking about skill and civilization is back very powerfully. And I suppose that's what I was trying to uh, imply. I would say that there's something peculiar about a written history of art that focuses almost entirely on two or three different disciplines. It's not a coincidence that they're also the most expensive uh, and the ones that the uh, marketplace values, like areas of painting and certain areas of sculpture. What I would say is that we need to, yes, think about art as a big creature, much wider, and to equalize it out far more. So now I'm far from the first person to say this. Great historians have been saying it for 100 years, but I think it's never been more relevant. The lovely thing about quite a lot of those ancient Greek pots is that they were very cheap in their own time. And uh, the I'm a very lucky boy. The There's a little pot with an owl on it, an ancient Greek pot with an owl. It's in the book. That's mine. Whoa, I know that pot. Yeah, it's a beautiful pot. And they were incredibly common because the owl was the symbol for Athens. Uh, it was the city's symbol. And they made those pots not least for the Panathenic Games. In other words, they were little drinking mugs. So it's a sports mug is what it is. <laughs> and, uh, and 
the, the and they were very cheap in their own time and there are there are a lot of them still around and a lot of them are quite intact because they were buried with their owners so it's kind of like being buried with your team's mug <laughs> uh, how many people would millions of us would still do that and it ties you up to the ancient Greeks, and it shows that that beautiful thing was easily buyable in its own time. Not dirt cheap, you know, it's nice, but, you know, you have to pay a bit more, but it's beautiful. So I think there's a politics and an economics of culture again, and for me, it, it moves around this idea of skill and how we're proposing to re-skill. You know, we all spend our lives looking for builders and looking for plumbers, and they tend to be older and older and older because the apprenticeship used to be six or seven years. That's not to disparage young plumbers and young, uh, but we seem even on a basic level of society to have um, put away the idea of skill as being less important. But actually, it remains very important in daily life. You know, the idea that we would say that skill isn't important in football, that, would, that wouldn't, you, you know, we understand it in sport. We understand how important skill is. We need to understand how important it is right across the face of culture for all of us. Uh, uh, it's to do with human dignity, I think, isn't it? And uh, how we think of ourselves and how we relate to each other. That's why Smith and Potter and Turner, uh, for, in my view, became the most common surnames. Uh, it's because we had traditionally had respect for those things anyway well to wrap up can you leave away maybe your instagram handle so that people could contact you if they had any questions and also can you plug how people can get the book uh yeah well uh, the book is available from bloomsbury on the site it's uh, available on amazon as well so it, the book is widely available and uh, uh, my Instagram, I can't remember my address. It's I think it's Paul Greenhouse 1893. It is, yes. Yeah, right. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> and I'd be delighted to catch up with, with folks there. And there's paulgreenhouse.net now as well, a uh, website. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. And, well, lovely to speak with you. Always nice to talk with a potter. I'd like to thank Paul for taking the time to come on the podcast and talk about his new book. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, Ceramic Art and Civilization, you can do that wherever fine books are sold. If you'd like to get in touch with Paul, you can do that through his website. That's paulgreenhosh.net. Also wanted to thank this week's sponsor, the Kansas City Clay Guild. They are currently accepting applications for their Artist in Residence program until April the 15th. The benefits for the program include a private studio space, free firing, opportunities to teach, and an annual stipend. To apply today, visit kcclayguild.org slash air. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. <laughs>